Welcome to episode 24 of the Hunt Back Country podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. In tonight's episode, we're diving into part one of two with Ben Gatormson from ASAC Camo. Ben's a really great guy who has quite the history in the industry, used to be a bow tech, kind of got into the manufacturing side, worked with black gold sites, and now he's with ASAC Camo. But more important than all that, Ben is a diehard, dedicated hunter. He's out pretty much year round and typically on average takes seven or nine animals a year. So the dude gets it done for sure, really knows his stuff. We dive into some really awesome topics, um, specifically talking about hunting from the ground. So everything from stalking to just kind of when to move, when to draw with your bow. Um, and it's not just specific to any species. If you're an elk hunter, a mule deer hunter, a whitetail hunter, an antelope hunter, a bear hunter, any of the above, if that's you, you're going to get something out of this episode. I had an absolute blast. I learned a ton, and I know that you will as well. Before we get into the show with Ben, just wanted to give a shout out to Joe Rivas. Sent us a really good email, some good questions and feedback on the podcast. We really appreciate that. Joe, we want to send you some Exo Mountain Gear swag for reaching out. If you, the listener, want to enter to these giveaways, all you have to do is go leave us a review on iTunes or email us your questions or feedback to podcast at exomountaingear.com. All right, on to this week's show with Ben Gatormson. All right, well, Ben, welcome to the podcast. How are you, man? I'm doing good. How are you, Mark? Good, thank you. Steve, you just, uh, what, you just literally got in the door from a uh, little hunt with your dog. How'd that go, man? Yeah, I was snuck out to uh, have a checker spot that's about an hour out of town, so left left the office a little bit early and snuck out and barely made it back in time for hit a snowstorm on the way back but it was oh, good did dog did good it's we only got a few days left here of, of uh, upland season so it was great to get out and enjoy the weather and yeah yeah that's awesome awesome so ben i guess um just to start off for listeners who aren't aware i mean you're a guy that you know kind of flies under the radar and i think that's somewhat intentional but can you kind of Give us some of your background from a hunting perspective and uh, sure. a little bit about, you know, your involvement in the industry, things like that. Definitely. I've uh, I've been working in the in the hunting industry since I was a teenager. I mean, uh, hunting and fishing has kind of always been my passion. And, uh, um, you know, shortly after kind of working on sales and doing stuff like that, I, I uh, really jumped in with bow hunting and, and that's kind of been where the last 15, 20 years have gone really. I mean, that's been my number one hobby from shooting competitively to, um, to, you know, pursuing all kinds of game. And it's my favorite thing to hunt is, is really whatever's in season. Um, so, I mean, in the spring I'm chasing bears, turkey, um, through the fall, obviously, you know, now that I live out West, um, antelope, and then elk, and then I kind of transition into deer and stuff like that. And you know, whatever whatever opportunities I have, I'm I'm pretty much getting after anything yeah. I can. So, um, and that was originally why I, I moved out west. Um, I grew up in Minnesota, and uh, um, have been out. I live in Bozeman, Montana now. Uh, I've been here f- since 2007, and um, I mean, love it. In Montana, you can hunt just about nine months a year seems like there's always something to do outside so it's uh it's definitely definitely it consumes my entire year you ask my wife and she'll just, <laughs> she'll just roll her eyes so yeah I'm sure. um, definitely <clears throat> so, so you went you went from being on the retail side to then kind of being on the manufacturing side with black gold sites for quite a while yeah yep i uh I started, I, I worked for a couple different bow shops uh, and, uh, you know, large box stores back in the in, in Minnesota. And then uh, I was with Sportsman's Warehouse and then their uh, rapid growth kind of um, was had the opportunity. I fell in love with spot and stock hunting. Um, I would I would hunt uh, the, the western part of the Dakotas, North and South Dakota, and I just loved it. I mean, it's it's. I mean, it trumped anything that I had ever done, you know, being able to watch an animal, you know, 
put something together, put a plan together, and then trying to stock that animal and and get within effective bow range was was a ton of fun. And I mean, I'd, I'd in competitive shooting, it brought me up, you know, in the Fargo area, North Dakota. And I mean, I just I'd be like a little kid. I'd get giddy just because I was four hours from where there were mule deer. Yeah, um, and that kind of that's where I got started in it. So with sportsmen's, they were they were putting stores in all over the place, and I'd worked my way up and uh, had an opportunity to to move to a store out west, and I was all over it. You know, I didn't have anything that really kept me in Minnesota, and I, I made the jump. And um, I mean, everything revolved around hunting. I know my first year out in Montana, I'd I'd put in because I knew I was moving well enough in advance to to potentially draw a tag and i i was of all the the management that moved there with the store i was one of the only people that had a a tag it was a non-resident tag because in montana you have to live there for six months before you're granted residency and i Uh. so i i hunted and my first year hunting i had all these spots picked out to hunt um you know using google and maps and i'm you know I, i moved out here and um, one of the spots turned out to be, you know, not knowing anything about Montana, it turned out to be one of the hardest areas to draw in the state for trophy bulls. So that I couldn't hunt there. And the other spot was a backcountry unit that had a, a rifle hunt that started September 15th, you know, and being a bow hunter. So I came to Montana with all this, you know, scouting via maps and Google Earth and everything. And I, I got out there. And I learned this and I'm like, I got to start all over, you know, just anticipating the season. And I ended up finding some new areas, had a couple guys suggest a couple areas. And and I actually ended up, uh, shooting a bull, um, something like nine miles from the trailhead, my first year hunting. And, uh, it's a nice introduction to elk hunting there. (laughs) Yeah. Right. You know, and I, I mean, it was, it was cool enough temperature wise. I, I, all the meat was good, but I mean, I, you talk about green, you know, you get a guy that first year in Montana, first year backcountry hunting, shooting an animal that big, that far back without a plan after the, oh yeah, I'm just going to put it in a backpack and I'm going to carry it out. Right. right. You know? <laughs> so I kind of learned the hard way in that regard, but it, it was a, it was a learning experience. And, uh, I mean, I've been into it ever since. I mean, it was, uh, I got, I, I will say this, I got lucky my first time. I mean, there was very, very little skill involved. I, I was with a guy that had elk hunted a couple times, and we just fell into one of those pockets that has, you know, a, a herd with multiple satellite bulls. I think on that same set that I killed that bull, I had three bulls come in. All, you know, two the first two obviously didn't present a shot, and this the bull I ended up shooting, you know, was in raking a tree at like 40 yards. It's just one of those things. The wind stayed perfect. Everything was right. And, uh, I mean, that, that got me hooked and, you know, I, I just started expanding my hunting. I mean, elk was obviously a a, a huge target species, you know, for me, but now I find that I almost enjoy, uh, you know, chasing antelope and stuff like that more because you're in the action so much more with elk. There's a lot of downtime, you know, you, to find the animals and stuff like that. So, Mm -hmm. and that was, that, that was kind of my first year. And then ever since then, I've just been kind of refining my techniques and stuff like that. So to get off track a little bit, sorry. Um, no, no, that's good. But yeah, I mean, that's uh, certainly yeah. that's certainly some of what we want to get into in, in terms yeah. of techniques and things that you've learned. Um, so yeah, we'll definitely get to that. I'm a, I'm a little little scatterbrained sometimes. I I get off on tangents. <laughs> no, <laughs> so, you're good. You're good. Um, but yeah, so I was with Sportsman's for a number of years uh, after I'd moved here and actually had. Um, became friends with Mike Ellick with Black Gold, who's one of the greatest guys, you know, I've ever met in the industry. And, uh, um, he had a position that opened up and I started working for him and, uh, you know, just took off with it. You know, I did, did well with that, you know, I mean, and with Black Gold, it's, it's a small company. So you're kind of, you got your hands in everything. You got your hands in, you know, the, the sales and the customer service and, uh, um, you know, the, the design and, I mean, they, they took some suggestions, you know, from us and stuff like that. And I was with them for four years and then I had a, an opportunity that, uh, you know, to, to maybe get myself a little further, more skin in the game a little bit, so to speak. 
and uh, you know Rob Smolik. I've been talking to him. He's the owner of ASAT Camouflage, and and currently for the last two years I've been working with Rob, and uh, we are uh, we're we're kind of finally getting our ducks in a row now, and and we've got a a, a new line of the ASAT brand camo. So a lot of people see ASAT as uh, you know they get confused. You know what is ASAT? Is ASAT you know they know what First Light is, and First Light makes awesome products. You know, I use a lot of their stuff. It, it's a more technical than the the ASAP brand products, but basically we're licensing them our pattern, and they make a lot of good stuff. And you know, I've I've bounced around. I've used a little bit of everything. I've used Sitka. I've used a Kuyu. I've used ASAT. You know, brand stuff. I've used a lot of the First Light stuff. And you know, it it's uh, it's all you know little niches of experience. And I mean, you know, there's there's things you learn along the way. And you know, I I feel like I've I've tried a, a fair amount of products and, you know, I'm this, some of the new stuff that we have in the ASAT line that we're coming out with is going to be really, really cool. So, yeah, let's we'll talk a little bit awesome. about, um, ASAT from a pattern perspective. I think, sure. you know, some of us are certainly familiar with the pattern and know Steve and I have worn it quite a bit, but you know, I think there's more, there's more history there than people realize. What is kind of the history and the story um, and what went into the development of that pattern? Because it's so unique. Definitely. ASAT is, it's, it's one of the original patterns. I think tree bark camo came out in the mid 80s, was the original camo pattern designed exclusively for the purpose of hunting. A lot of guys were wearing plaids. And like the old woodland uh, military fatigues, the military camo before that, and you know a market was, you know, built. And ASAT that came out. Tree bark was was right around the same time. I think the same year. And then you have the, you know, real tree and mossy oak, and and everybody kind of jumped into this this you know, basically it was a, it was an un, undiscovered market and. Uh, uh, ASAT's philosophy and the, and how the pattern came about, it was actually designed in the, in the Eastern part of the U S outside of Harrisburg. And, uh, I know from, from the, basically the, the background of the pattern, uh, the, the pattern is based on experiences that the developers had with animals. You know, a lot, a lot of the other patterns, some of the patterns now, they, they go into a lot of detail about what does an animal see? Mm-hmm. You know, and and what colors can they see? Can they see colors? You know, can a bear see blue? Can a bear see red? You know, can a deer see something different? You know, based on on their eyes. Until we have enough technology to plug a human brain into the eyeballs of a deer or any other species, we don't know. It's all speculation. So, you know, they do studies and stuff like that. But the ASAP pattern itself was based on experiences that the users had and i know um i know that over ten thousand man hours were put into the development of the pattern the colors and uh you know the the it's it's you know how the how the the dark shapes you know and contrast against the light background and i think ultimately the basis of it was that and and this is how i see it is is the pattern breaks up the shape of a human better than than anything else and asat's unique in its following i mean there's not a lot of marketing that's behind the pattern and how it works you don't see full page ads you don't see tv commercials you know you know bill jordan had that monster bucks you know series and you know mossy oak had similar you know hunting tv shows back in the day and videos and and uh that was a that was its that was the marketing aspect you know i'll i'll be the first to tell you ASAT's the ugliest pattern on the market. You know, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not one to tell somebody it's good looking. It you know it draws you in and and it doesn't do that. But when you get it in the field, when you see it, you know, somebody scrambling up a, a a shale embankment, or if you're in the lodge poles and and you get somebody that's 40 yards away and they stop, you you don't see the human shape. And I think that's what animals see, and that's what they you know, puts them at high alert and, you know, puts them in an alarm state. And I mean, I know a lot of people that use it for the first time, you know, are, 
I mean, it's, it's, it's a different experience. You know, your hunting experience is different in, you know, when you're using the pattern. I mean, do you, do you have to have ASAT to be successful? Absolutely not. But I think it gives you that little bit of an edge, that little bit of a, an advantage over, over the use of, uh, you know, somebody else's pattern. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, different philosophies lend themselves different ideals on, on how things work. And, uh, it's, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've hunted with it now exclusively for two years. I've used it kind of intermittent with other stuff. And I mean, I'm, I get away with stuff on antelope that, you know, would blow you away. I mean, in, in previously used, you know, um, patterns and, and different garments and stuff like that. I mean, I, I got busted a couple times, you know, in previous years where I got away with it, you know, wearing like the, the 3d leafy suit. So, and, uh, it's, it, it's just one of those things that, you know, you, you can't really, you can tell somebody about it all day long, but until they actually experience it mm-hmm. and, and see the effect and how, how it works, it's, it's, it's different. So, yeah. and you know, yeah, I'd say that's my, when the, when I first started using it, it's funny that you mentioned that it's ugly. Cause when, uh, Lenny and I started pre elevation productions, you know, first light, I can't remember what patterns they had at the time, but they had ASAT and we were like, we just chose it because it was different. You know, we didn't know if mm-hmm. it was going to work or not, but we we're like, Hey, that's different. It stands out. It'll, somebody will see us wearing that. And, uh, I remember that first year I'm, you know, my basis was I, I'm not typically the type of guy that's like, you need to be wearing camo. You're not going to kill an animal if you're not wearing mm-hmm. real tree or something. You know, it was, it was always I, like the old, I remember I had a friend who was a diehard Mossy Oak breakup fan and we'd be out hunting and he'd get a hundred yards away and it was like he was just wearing black, you know, black pants, yeah. black jacket, just turned into this dark blob. Uh, so I wasn't a big camel fan and I just turned to wearing solid colors most of the time. Uh, and anyways, that, that first year wearing ASAT, I, I remember, you know, I, I think there's so many other more important things that go into actually killing an animal. Um, but, I remember like walking across this opening where we're hunting mule deer and a, I was trying to get just like, it's like a 20 yard opening. I had to get across it. And there was a doe that, you know, I knew she could possibly see me if she picked her head up. And of course, you know, right in the middle of the opening, she does. And she looks at me cause she saw movement, but I just held still. And then she looked at me for like 20 seconds, put her head back down, went back to feeding. Um, and in past experiences that, you know, I was just blown away that I, I got away with it because in mm-hmm. past experience, that deer would, you know, they'd look at you for a minute, they'd put their head down. The second you move it, you know, a 64th of an inch, they'd freaking whip their head back up and do that and then eventually blow out of there. Yeah. Um, and since that first experience, you know, I, I've i had just, I mean, every season there seems to be one or two instances like that where I'm able to get away with something that I would not have uh, if I wasn't wearing it. So um, it definitely... Just like you mentioned, I think it breaks up your outline enough to where after a while they realize or think that you're nothing. Yeah, and I, I hear from, from users, and, and I've experienced this myself, when, when an animal stops and looks at you, um, they almost look through you. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they, don't see, they don't see your, 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 your shape. And I mean, from the predator-prey relationship that we have with any of these animals we're hunting, these animals every year are – are pursued by people and in that pursuit they learn different things and, and you know they're that are passed down from the the matriarchal doe or something like that where if they see your shape if it's 400 yards if it's 100 yards it seems like even if you're not moving sometimes when they see that shape that shape of an upper body legs you know shoulders arms you know everything they're on to you and mm-hmm. it seems like it happens a lot less in my experience i've i've gotten away with um i mean an example is the the bull that i killed this year in idaho um i i had to drop down an opposing hillside so there this bull has had been with his cows i've been watching them all morning and as this bull drops down you know he's he's kind of looking for a spot to water down this little ravine you know coolie whatever you want to call it and i'm on the opposite side and it's all sage it's nothing but sage. There's a tree here. There's a tree there. But I have nothing in between me and him. And basically, I just started walking down that hill. And when he would stop and kind of, you know, not be moving real quick, I'd have to stop. 
you know, and as soon as he started moving or not paying attention, I'd start moving again. And, and this is from roughly about 300 yards down to, you know, effective bow range. You know, he's elevated looking across this ravine, this coulee. I'm at the same eye level and we're both dropping down at the same time. And, and I mean, a pattern that breaks up your outline, breaks up your shape is, is I think what, what makes ACE that difference. Nobody, you know, there's a lot of patterns that are coming out now and, you know, you hear about macro patterns and micro patterns and stuff like that. I think they all, they, they want to be everything. They, the, the new patterns that are out, they want to be some of both. And I think ASAT is so far from, you know, the, the micro style pattern, you know, an animal has to start from a, a further distance than a closer distance when it comes to getting close to you. So as an animal moves throughout whatever habitat it's in, it's constantly scanning at the farthest distance it can see well, you know, and depending on the animal, a hundred yards, 200 yards, 300 yards, you know, and you have to get past that, that animal's radar, so to speak, with its eyes, because you, you know that if they smell you, they're gone. So you, you're, the wind has to be in your favor. And, you know, sight is their, you know, their secondary line of defense, depending on the animal you're talking about. So, um, you start out at that 100 or 200 yard mark. And as you work your way in, once you get in that animal's comfort zone, he's almost looking past you. They're looking out at their, you know, their, their circle. And once you're inside that, it's almost like they don't even notice you. So, and I think that's a, a large part to do with the pattern. A lot of these other patterns that are out there focus on small detail. And the thing is, is small detail looks great on a rack, you know, when you're buying yeah. camel in a, in a store. In the store. Yep. Exactly. And, and ASAT, if you put ASAT next to any other pattern, I, I, I'll give it one award and that's, it's, it's hideous. It's horrible to look at. But it gets you in close, and that's, you know, that's the, the magic of it. And I think it's you have to pick one or the other. You need to either be not attractive looking on the shelf and be more effective in the field, or you pick the other. And everybody wants to be sellable and more consumer-driven because what we see is, as hunters, as, as a consumer, is what they're trying to catch with a lot of these other patterns, I think. So, and there's, I mean, like you say, I mean... Camo gets you so far and it helps you get away with stuff, but you can't put all your successes on the use of one particular camo. I mean, right. I, I, I really like a lot of the stuff that's out there now, but I know in my experience it's not going to work as well as other things. So, <clears throat> yeah, That's pretty cool. We A couple of years ago, my buddy and I were hunting elk in Colorado, and one of those situations where we were kind of doing a little calling sequence and thought we heard a response and et cetera, et cetera. We ended up, we were calling in another hunter. Uh, he was kind of doing some cow calls and we figured it out like, oh, this is, this is a guy working his way in. I think everybody that's hunted has done that. Is, yeah. Hey, that's a hunter. I'm going to call that guy in. And, yeah. So you know. we ended up calling him to like, you know, 25, 30 yards and he just wasn't seeing us. And finally I kind of, you know, safely waved and stepped out because he's kind of approaching with a, you know, an arrow knocked and stuff like that. And, uh, we were both head to toe ASAP, my buddy and I. And he goes, Oh, I heard about you guys. He goes, We ran into, you know, some other group a couple days ago and they, they asked us, Did you see those two bow, crazy bow hunters with the crazy camo on? <laughs> and so they were talking about ASAP and he was like, That stuff's wild. And I was like, Well, hey, man, we called you in like 25 yards and you didn't see us standing there, did you? You know, it was pretty <laughs> funny. Yeah. But yeah, it, it is pretty, uh, that's an interesting pattern, you know, to the naked eye. But yeah, I mean, that's been certainly our experiences. It's effectiveness. Definitely. So definitely. Cool. So let's, let's transition to talking about, um, you know, some of what makes you successful as a hunter, uh, Ben, and you, you know, you hunt so many species. Um, and you know, just, I know you have so much experience to share. One of the first things, just kind of the idea of hunting and specifically hunting from the ground, whether that be spot and stalk or an ambush type hunt or even decoy, because I know that you've done it all and you've done it on multiple species. You know, one of the first key elements, I think, is cover and concealment. And I think guys get those mixed up. Can you kind of talk about what is cover, what is concealment, and how to use them effectively? 
I mean, cover and concealment, you know, when it comes to putting a stock on an animal, I mean, it might be, you know, depending on the scenario, it might be that one object. It might be a, a, a subalpine fir tree that's, that's two and a half feet tall between you and that animal. It might be a boulder that allows you to get behind it and go in on that animal. You know, hunting open country really, really allows you to, to kind of see this, see the big picture, you know, when you see pictures of these, of people making an approach, sometimes that one sage bush that's six or eight inches taller than the rest of them. And you, you may have to slide to the left or to the right on a, on a muley buck or on a, um, on an antelope to get that object between you. Well, as you're crawling, you know, you say you're, you're, you're belly crawling in, you know, you're, you're still, you're still having to elevate yourself a little bit, and that little bit might be exactly what you need to, to conceal your movement and get that next ten yards. You know, and and that's that ten yards is that's bow hunting. I mean, ten yards can make or break the difference between a shot and no shot. You know, and and I think most experienced people have that get into bow hunting. I think a lot of the bow hunting public started rifle hunting, and you don't think of those things. Uh, um, I haven't picked up a rifle in a long time. This this last year was the first year that I I did, and I kept I I, I had a doe antelope tag, and I was like I I have this new gun my wife bought me for our wedding, and uh, I'm like I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot an antelope doe. Antelope is one of my favorite meats to eat, so I'm not gonna let this tag go to waste. And uh, I kept getting in way too close, so I I couldn't you know, pull my gun up and shoot, you know, I mean, it was like, I didn't have a bipod. I didn't feel comfortable shooting offhand at like 75 yards and using the tactics and the, and stuff that I use bow hunting didn't work very good for rifle because I had, a, I was so ingrained with, with using the terrain. I mean, anytime you can eliminate your, your movement via a small hill, uh, a ditch, um, anything like that, um, that's, that's, I think, the biggest thing. You know, people try to go straight in at an animal. And sometimes it's the easiest path, but it's not always the best. Um, I killed a, an, an antelope buck uh, last year. Um, it looked like a mowed lawn. And what it was, it was a flood irrigated field. And this flood irrigated field had... Um, two or three little ditches that ran through it that the flood irrigation when they divert the water and the majority of that water would travel down this ditch. And it was about six inches deep. And I started at 300 yards. I got one little patch of willows between me and this buck. I walked at that. And at that point I was 200 yards. And then I had to get, I had to basically stay as flat as I could and belly crawl across this, you know, like I said, a mowed lawn, like seriously, like a, it looked like a, a fairway at a golf course. I had to get across that to this small depression. And then at that depression, I had to get, um, you know, the, the rest of the way. So I belly crawled through this, um, this little trough, so to speak, another 150 yards. And I got to a point where I ran out of you know, trough. I could continue, but I would, now I would be getting further away from this antelope buck and he'd been bedded for a while. And I think a lot of people feel like they have to get within bow range of that animal. And not always is that the case. I feel like too many people are over aggressive because that animal's senses are what keeps it alive. If you can let that animal get up and move in your direction, a lot of times that's where a lot of my successes have come, you know, in that particular scenario, I think I got to like 75 or 80 yards on that antelope buck and he was bedded down. And, uh, I'm like, well, it took me two hours to get here. So he's not going to stay bedded all day. And, uh, I just waited him out and he got up, he started feeding my direction and I ended up shooting him at 35 yards. And I think uh, uh, the majority of bow hunters they they hear about these guys shooting these animals at at you know a mule deer at at fifty or a mule deer at seventy a mule deer you know an elk whatever it is I think what what happens 
in one's mind is they say, well, I have to get to 50 or I have to get to 70 or I have to get to 35, whatever, you know, distance provides you that shot. And a lot of people don't realize patience has a lot to do with, with what ends up being a successful hunt. And the more patient you can be, once you're inside a hundred yards, if you look, if that animal gets up and he feeds, you know, there's a 360 degree circle that that animal can go. Well, if he comes in, in the direction toward you in a, in a 30% say piece of that circle, he's probably going to offer you a shot. Cause if he comes in that 30 to 30% of that circle, he's coming towards you. And if you, if you learn the habits of these animals and you, you, you have an idea of maybe what they're going to do after you, you bed them up, if you've seen them in that location more than once, I mean, the more, you know, the better your, your, your odds for success. And, uh, um, I attribute that to that. I mean, I've been trying to get on that antelope buck that I killed at 35 yards all season. And it was the, I think it was the day before rifle season opened. And I, uh, I worked in on him and got to that point. I said, you know what? I'm not going to push my luck. These animals, he sees me. I'm never going to be able to draw. So if he gets up and starts feeding, if he comes in my direction and I'd seen him bed up in the same little flat several times and he was kind of towards the the left side of where he normally was and where he normally would feed. So I thought, well, maybe he'll come back my direction. And, you know, nine times out of ten, he might not. But, you know, who knows? It, it, the cards rolled out right there. So. Yeah. so in a scenario like that where you have a bedded animal, you can move towards them and, you know, say you can cover, you know, 180 degrees depend on your approach basically because you know another factor like wind Mm -hmm. if you don't have previous intel on him um and maybe the direction that he would tend to feed what other factors are you looking at when you're sort of picking the position and hoping he will move in you know a or b direction what what other factors besides just previous intel would you be looking at to try anticipate i mean no there's no guarantees for sure yeah but as you're making your decision, what's kind of going through your mind? Well, I mean, like high country mule there and, and uh, in my experiences, they, they typically don't do a lot out of straight up the hill or straight down the hill movement. I mean, unless they're fleeing a predator or something like that, they're typically moving up at an angle or straight across, you know, to a, a timber patch to bed. Um, that's an excellent scenario. If you can... If, if you don't have an approach from above, for example, if, if an animal's bedded and, and you're in the wide open, you have no approach from above, if you get in, say it's really, really calm and quiet one day and you know you have thermals that are going to carry your scent in your favor, if you get to a position where you're at the limitation of, of you feel your concealment via noise and, and cover, chances are that animal, when he comes out, he's going to move across the hill. And in that scenario... If he goes away from you, obviously you're not going to have a shot. But if he comes toward you, chances are you're going to have a shot. So, I mean, that's a scenario with, with like deer. And the same thing with elk. You know, if you're hunting elk in real steep country, they, they'll move across the hill, you know, in a, in a steep section at angles. You know, they're, they're, they're never going straight up or straight down unless they're bumped or pushed or trying to evade something um, or, you know, coming into a call. So, I, I mean, I use stuff like that. I mean, I've had scenarios where I've, um, you know, used thermals on elk and, and just gotten in a position where I know it's a travel corridor. And, and I think a lot of people don't take into account that the easiest thing to do is get to where these animals are going to be. And they, 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 they have it for, for a, a large frequency of their time. If you can get to those positions, you know, this is more of an ambush type situation, mm-hmm. you know, and when, when I'm hunting and the, you know, the elk aren't bugling and I'm, I'm hunting in areas that don't have a lot of, uh, you know, you, you don't, you can't glass elk and when you're in all timber. So you have to get yourself in a position, a saddle, um, a, a travel cord or a, a, maybe a string of benches where these animals are moving and then just, you know, gauge on the wind and, and, you know, these animals are going to move across the hill, you know, from a, from a feeding position maybe. And, you know, they start at higher elevation or lower elevation and they kind of come, come down at an angle and they, they, they move across the hill. So 
it's all relative to the area. And I mean, the game trails are, are telling in, in what these animals like to do. So, and it's, it's like I say, it's, it's an odds thing. And in those scenarios, that's the, the, you know, the, the things you got to consider the most when it comes to being successful. Yeah. So yeah. Ter- <clears throat> go ahead, Steve. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, I think that was one of the biggest lessons for me that I kind of had to figure out on my own is I think early on in my hunting career, it just felt like the animal, like I had to get to that animal right then and there as fast as I could. Cause if I didn't, they were going to move and be gone. And I think once you kind of start to realize that unpressured animals really, they move from bedding to feeding, but there's a lot of just sitting around. And, and, uh, for me, it sounds like you've been as well. Just patience has been the, the key to yep. success of, of getting in close. And, you know, there's times when you do have to be aggressive, but more often than not, it's, it's about just settling down and waiting for something to happen. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. A, a good friend of mine uh, told me just this last season, you know, we were talking about, you know, different strategies and stuff. And, um, you know, I said, you know, just sit there, you know, wait, let that animal make the mistake. Don't force yourself to make the mistake because mm-hmm. that's either a shot opportunity or a, or a fleeing animal. I mean, that's what it comes down to. And he told, he said to me, and it's stuck, but this phrase, and I carry this with me, I, I say it to myself quite a bit, patience kills. So mm-hmm. next time you're, you feel the pressure, like you have to get on this animal and, uh, and, and you, you know, you need to make that push to that next bush, but all that animal has to do is get up for you to get that shot. Just wait, just wait. And that's, and that's, I mean, it comes in time and I mean, you'll, you'll screw up a couple shots, but I mean, and that's, you know, growing up hunting out of tree stands and stuff like that. That's, you know, you talk about patience, you know, sitting in a tree stand for eight hours, you know? And, uh, I think a lot of guys are, are a little bit over aggressive in situations and, and, you know, with a, with an animal, with a trophy class animal, you always run that risk of blowing that animal out of there. So, I I mean, I was on my elk hunt this year in Idaho, um, killing that bull that I talked about earlier on that, on that opposite hillside, we were both moving down at the same time. Um, I'd scouted those bulls. I kind of had an idea what their pattern was. And, uh, he wasn't even the, 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 in my eyes, I don't think he was the biggest bull in the base. And there were a couple that were similar in size and he showed up and he was kind of off pattern on the other bulls that I'd watched, but I was patient. I didn't over pursue, um, that morning I'd actually moved down and I was kind of shadowing the herd. I was in a situation where they were vocal enough. I didn't need to call. And I was just trying to work in and get a shot as he was kind of, you know, working around his cows and, and it was opening day in Idaho and it got to a point where it dropped down. And I know that these animals dropped down into this bowl and they bedded in the bottom. Well, if I would have continued to pursue that animal or that herd down into that bottom, the thermal would have, would have changed as I worked down the hill into the timber and it would have sucked all my scent down in there. And I wouldn't have had that play that afternoon, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, that's another huge thing that I've, I've, uh, I've added is elk, you know, as an example, elk are pretty habitual unless you're in a really high pressure area. You got guys coming from all sides on, on, on these bulls. They, they are, they're pretty routine. You know, you get into the heat, the heart of the rut and they're not, I mean, that's, that's kind of out the window, you know, that's the white tail rut. I mean, you could have that buck pattern, September, October, you know, they start to get a little weird. And then November, it's like, oh man, that buck got killed seven miles away. You know, that's, that's, that's what they turn into. And what I've learned is that, you know, these animals, you know, if, if, if you think they're, they're leaving, the only reason they're going to completely vacate a basin is if you bump them or if they've been bumped or if there's, there's another reason. Um, if you see them start to slowly work out of a basin up and over a ridge, um, I mean, you, with your own eyes, that's, that's the thing. But if you, you hear them bugle down in the bottom in the trees, chances are they're still going to be there that afternoon. You know, mm-hmm. if your wind is kind of iffy and uh, I, I would say, just wait, let's just wait. You know, they could move off. I mean, that's, that's a risk you always take, but if they're there for a reason and they're there and they're comfortable there, they're, they're going to want to stay there. So, um, when I first started elk hunting, when I moved out west, I just kind of wandered around, you know, when the elk weren't bugling and 
every once in a while I'd run into stuff. But what I learned was if I heard an elk bugle on a particular side hill or, or, or on a ridge, chances are that bull was, was going to be there three days from now. It's going to be there probably tomorrow unless I go up there and I push him off of it. So if the conditions aren't perfect in that scenario, you know, be patient, you know, pull off and, you know, let, let the, you know, the, 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 the wind, let the, you know, the, the time of day dictate when you move and how you move. So. <clears throat> Great advice. Well, that's a wrap for part one, guys. Be sure to join us for episode 25, part two with Ben Katormson. 